Hello, today I'm going to be talking you through The Divine Image by William Blake, which is in The Songs of Innocence. And this also will parallel and both contrast with the human abstract, which we'll come on to later in Songs of Experience. Now, the first thing I just want to get our head around is the title and actually the key definitions and meanings um, amongst that. So the word divine um, links with godly features and attributes, um, omniscient ideas there as well. And the idea of the image here is that man was made in the image of God. So essentially this poem is all about ways that we should um, model God's, God's attributes and God's sort of um, understanding of the world for us to be a more divine um, and a better human being as well. So I think it's really worth noting how important Christ is, um, which I think we've explored before, this idea that you know, Christ is the, the kind of the middleman between both being able to connect with, with human beings and also God. So he's that divine spirituality that is able to, to be the mediator between. And actually, Blake is potentially arguing in this poem that every human being has the ability to adopt these divine features of mercy, pity, peace and love um, so that we in turn can become like God's image in himself. So these attributes then, mercy, pity, peace and love, um, I think is the very substance of what we think of when we think of God. Uh, but actually Blake is also arguing, or the speaker of this poem, that these main virtues can also be mapped onto human beings as well. So this poem does a job to personify each of these virtues and by doing that is making a very deliberate um, choice in, in showing how they can also be formed in human beings as well. So, to mercy, pity, peace and love all pray in their distress and to these virtues of delight return their thank thankfulness. So we're going to see uh, the contrast here of distress and delight. They kind of seem oxymorons here in that. And in order to perhaps get yourself out of um, distress, need um, or any sort of human emotions that, that you can feel um, will always be placed onto these four features. And in order to experience the virtues of delight, you need to um, undergo and, and take on these these feelings um, ourselves. What I'm also noticing as well about the poem is the repetition of, um, of this sort of first person pronoun plural, our um, incorporating this idea that we're, we're all involved, we all have to be part of this together if we're going to make the world a better place. So always really important to notice some of those pronouns because they tell us so much about who this poem is speaking to. It also acknowledges if there is any form of othering in a, a text as well. But I think in this sense, it's about unifying everybody together um, in the, the, the important and divine message from God. So as we progress further into the second quatrain, um, is God our father dear? So it kind of um, dispels the argument across all different religions because we're acknowledging that everybody can have their own individual God in their lives. There isn't one above an overall God, but actually acknowledging that we can all worship um, a different God. And actually this poem is instructing us to be mindful of that and also inclusive of other people's beliefs as well. So our father dear, but despite the differences in the gods that may be believed in um, and worshipped, um, they're all dear to us, um, so hence the use of the word our that I've picked out there. However, um, what I think the speaker is trying to do here is to remind us that um, man as well has a job and a duty um, to, to take on these attributes. Um, and that's why we have here is man, um, his child and care. So I think child there is referencing to Jesus. Um, but also how yeah man has to look after um, and pass on these own um, kind of goodly ways to the to the next generation as well. 
As we approach the third stanza, uh, for mercy has a human heart, pity a human face, and love the human form divine and peace the human dress. So in each line here, the attributes are all personified. Um, so the emotions are kind of anthropomorphized, which what I mean by that is when you make something abstract um, into a more sort of human form. So all of these features here are embodied by the speaker because we see that, um, so mercy is linked with a heart, pity, a human face, love um, through the body and also peace in the dress. And these are recognisable features uh, in as human beings, aren't they? Because it's referring to the heart, face, body and clothes. So in turn, if we adopt these principles, then they can become recognisable features in the human body itself and within us. As we approach the next stanza, um, and every man of every clime, so the repetition here of every, uh, to really consolidate how these are universal attributes, we can all experience them, we can all access them, um, we just need to, to adopt that more sort of goodly nature within us. Um, and that in distress that we should pray to the human form divine. So it's like this idea that when we entertain these values and live by them, uh, then we're doing our best in order to aspire to, to divinity and actually being closer um, in our relationship with God. And actually in doing so, we also need to, as I said before, acknowledge that um, there is this belief uh, that people have in other gods as well, which brings us on to the final stanza, um, and all must love the human form. So once again, this idea of unison, everyone coming together, and um, the the modal verb must, it kind of has this sort of um, command to it, we, and this strong desire that we all need to embrace this. We all must love the human form. Um, in heaven, Turk or Jew. So the word Turk there could be a reference to um, actually uh, Islam and the Muslim faith um, and also, you know, Judaism. So uh, no matter what beliefs or traditions um, that a person has, um, all of them kind of help to play a part in how we experience um, our relationship with the divine um, in everyday life. Where mercy, love and pity dwell. So pity dwell, the word dwell there I've highlighted because it could be um, a symbol of of kind of like this, this paradise on earth if we all adopt these features um, and because that is where God is dwelling too. So this idea that God is actually inside all of us in these everyday acts of compassion and kindness, but it's down to us in order to, to tease it out really. I'm also going to zoom in on the word dwelling and notice that it is a present participle because I can recognise that it is in a continuous present through that ing um, ending there. So this kind of suggests that God is, is going to continue to wait for us to adopt these godly values um, and in doing so that's when we can have that strong relationship with God and, and a better entrance into heaven that way. So essentially to kind of um, reflect upon the end of this poem is this idea that we all need to adopt um, the traits of mercy, pity, peace and love in order to become an image of God and everything that God is supposed to encompass and radiate um, across society. But on a sort of um, more cynical note, which you might be able to pick up, you know, is there this sort of like Christian missionary view that's also implied here that this idea that you all have to be able to live by these qualities in order to attain happiness on earth? Down to you, it, I think it comes down to the fact that it depends what you think Songs of Innocence is, is there to do. As we know, it isn't so clear cut that Songs of Innocence is this sort of, um, you know, the childlike, innocent view of life is is idealised, you know, but there is always that sense of darkness there. But it's worth considering to what extent the darkness is needed for this poem.